<laughs> Hi, uh, viewers, the me and team here, and welcome back to Let's Play Civilization 4 multiplayer with Mao. In this video, we are going to continue taking it to Pakal. Um, unfortunately, I do not quite uh, finish him off in this video, but uh, next time, viewers, next time. Uh, well, I'm cutting him down to two cities in this video. So I'll uh, kick things off here by, once again, going to the comments. And the uh, first one that I'm going to look at is Skew's Tubes question, which is, how long is too long to do post-war rebuild? He describes his problem as uh, it takes his workers too long to get improvements uh, set up in the captured cities, and uh, it takes too long to rebuild the infrastructure within the cities to the point where they're actually useful. So uh, he wants to know is how long is too long and how to do that, because the AI tends to suck at setting up the cities. Well, excuse Tube, um, I agree with you that the AI sucks at setting up its cities. So that's just something that we have to find a way to work around. Uh, generally, when you're capturing cities, you, you have to have some kind of long-term plan in mind for what you want to do after the war. Do you want to set up for additional war? Or are you going to switch over to uh, more of an economic build-up phase after the war and attempt to either attack rapidly and try to shoot for culture or space or whatever? Because which you choose will affect both your tile improvement choices in the new cities as well as what buildings you build and do not build in those cities. For example, if you are intending to continue in war and your the captured cities are hammer poor, I would recommend just uh, workshopping over them and state properly property, starting with the least useful tiles first. You know, maybe leave the towns, but otherwise uh, workshop over any other flat land improvements that are not specials. And then, really, those cities only need a couple things, viewers. You only need, like, the forge, factory power, like, the production improvements, if you even have those available yet. Uh, barracks, and whatever you need in terms of keeping the happy cap decent and the health cap decent. Like, you don't want the city starving off its good hammer tiles. So as long as you manage those things, that's all you need before you start building units. Now... It's going to take a little longer if you choose the economic recovery and technology route. The reason it takes longer is that you need to build more buildings. Now all of a sudden you might want to consider the bank, you might want to consider uh, markets and grocers so you can grow the city more than you would want to otherwise. Um, you'll definitely want to consider the research improvements, which would be library, observatory, university, and in the very late game, even the um, laboratories. So that's a lot of hammers right there. And even with all that, you still probably want some production multipliers to set it up before the game is functionally over. So if you're going to do that, make sure that you have enough time before the game ends before you do that. Otherwise, just turn it into a hammer city and build wealth or research. That's something you have to think about. Ask yourself, okay, how long will this city take to set up and uh, what am I losing against if I just go the hammer multipliers and build wealth research or units right away? And using that as a rule of thumb, it'll give you a better picture as to whether you want to set up the city for hammers or set up the city for something else. Also, if it's a very early rush, early in the game, you can use the city for anything, even like great person farm or whatever. Like say you chariot rush somebody or something along those lines. But yeah, once you're talking like this time frame or later, you really want to turn around the new cities as rapidly as possible. Now, in my case, there's hills everywhere. Pakal actually did me a favor in a sense by farming a lot of his land. So, I, you know, he already has the food to work the mines. And he built the Apostolic Palace for me. So by building the Buddhist uh, monasteries and temples in the city early after capturing it, I not only get a significant amount of culture, especially considering I'm about to capture Sistine Chapel, but I also get hammers that continue to work for the rest of the game, pretty much. Although with the monasteries, they go away after scientific method, which I don't get in this game until, you know, right at the end. So really, the monasteries and temples are the way to go for really anything but a granary in those cities. 
Uh, so in my case, I do not have much trouble t uh, turning around in terms of economy here. As you can see, I've already switched most of my other cities off of building units too, with uh, only a couple exceptions. Um, also, yeah, as you can see, Pakala scores drops, and I'm climbing. Uh, just last video, I was third among the humans and behind Pakal, so I was like fourth on the overall um, score chart. And uh, at this point, only MLS is ahead of me, and the uh, gap is narrowed. Now, he is ahead of me in technology, and he will remain so, I believe, for the rest of the game, or at least the majority of the rest of the game. Now, I think it's all of it. But the biggest factors in score in this game are land and population, so there you go. Okay, here I'm taking a look at how uh, Mackie was progressing with Bismarck. Uh, I'm... After her early rush, things really slowed down on her a bit. I don't think she was quite prepared for the number of cities that Bismarck was going to settle, even during war. So after her unit stagnated, it really slowed her war efforts down. And that's something that's a little bit more uh, scrappy on a no-technology trading game. So you do have to be careful with that. Um... One of the reasons I didn't go after Pakal was that. The other is just he's just a little bit too far away, and some of his cities weren't so good. And, okay, let's have a look at the next question. Um, why did you keep the city to the right of the gold? It seemed to suck. Okay, this question was by um, Klaus Biomadsen, I guess. That's how you say it. If not, I, If that's wrong, I apologize. Anyway, why did I keep the city? Well... It doesn't matter how much these cities suck right now, because I'm capturing wonders that make religious buildings all the much better. I He might have even had um, University... or not University, Sankor. Well, he might have. He might have had Sankor and Spiral Minaret. I don't know. But at the very minimum, I had the Apostolic Palace, and it was late enough in the game, and I had banks in my commerce cities, that I could fund those cruddy little cities, and with the base hammers from the Apostolic Palace and working a couple hammer tiles, they could uh, bring me respectable production without costing me too much in maintenance. And as you can see over to the right there, MLS is joining the war, but he's having trouble in it. Um, uh, he really didn't bring enough siege or enough units in general, so uh, he pretty much stalled on the first city. And he's going to be working on that city for a while. Uh, meanwhile, I'm just going to continue to sweep up to the second to last city myself using Trebs and my crossbow unique unit. So yeah, that's why I'm keeping the weaker cities, because there's really no disincentive to keeping them. Next question! Why do you press the button which allows you to see the squares? I don't really see the advantage. I, uh, that's just personal preference for yours. I kind of like it on after playing with it on and off for a long time. Um, that question was by uh, Alexandru1914. And, uh, yeah, I just like how it looks visually a little better. It gives me a better picture of how everything's situated, but it, it doesn't matter, just like he said. If you want to play with it off, go ahead. Now, I would advocate strongly leaving tile yields on and the resource icons on, unless you just have a really good eye for the resource icons. But there's actually an advantage to tile yields, and that you can identify ocean squares that have land near them before you actually get near the land to see the land, because ocean squares within two tiles of land have a commerce and food, as you can see, when whereas when they're further out, you cannot. So that gives you an advantage in finding nearby land. And on top of that, you can see strategic resources in AI territory before you the proper tech, especially iron, because the AI's tile will have too many hammers to be a, to be a standard tile, so you know there's something there. And by looking at their text, you can figure out what it probably is, well, by looking at their text against yours. Uh, most typical one there is, of course, iron, but there are others as well. So those are that's two good reasons for keeping tile yields on, and it's at least for me, it's also just easier for me to tell what the improvements are just by looking at the tile yields. And the final question for today's video, and this one is by uh, let me check here, MTG for Life, uh, Magic the Gathering for Life, I guess. I don't know if I should admit to knowing that I know those initials or not. 
Actually, I never got into that game, but it does seem interesting. Anyway, that is a little bit of a broad question. There are... <laughs> I, I can't dedicate an answer to that in this section. I, I would like you to be a little more specific in terms of Hall of Fame, because otherwise it's just hard. And I, there's a lot of approaches, and it varies. So, um, yeah, let me know more specific. That'll about wrap it up for this video. Hope you guys are enjoying this. I'll see you in the next one when we take Pakal down for good. Me and team signing out.